So good afternoon and welcome. For those of you who might not know, uh, I'm Michaela Keat and I'm on faculty here at the College of Law. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to the college this afternoon. And as we gather here today, we acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our, our relationship um, among one another. We're delighted that so many of you could join us for this special lecture this afternoon. And uh, I want to note and thank the members of the, of the judiciary who are uh, here with us today, Judges Morin and, and Judge Heritance. Uh, this lecture is part of a special chair, uh, the Cy Halleck Visiting Scholar in Advocacy position. The chair was created 10 years ago in 2009, uh, and it was made possible by a generous gift uh, from Cy Halleck and supplementary gifts from his friends and, and admirers. Cy, so let me say a word about, um, about Cy's uh, importance uh, here in the profession. Cy Halleck uh, graduated from the College of Law in, in 1961, and he's one of Saskatchewan's most distinguished advocates, um, for those of you who are, who are new to the profession. He was a leading lecturer in the Federation of Law Society's criminal law conferences in the 1980s and the 90s, and he's represented, and this I'm sure m most of you know, he's represented many countless prominent clients. And he's served as counsel in several very important public inquiries throughout the country. For 10 years, the Cy Halleck Visiting Scholar in Advocacy has been bestowed upon prominent legal scholars, uh, prominent legal advocates. And it's a special set of criteria that we look at um, in terms of uh, who can speak to the topic and share experiences um, as uh, excellent advocates uh, in Canada. And uh, this year, our chair is, uh, it's our privilege to have the chair being held by uh, Christine Glazer, uh, QC, who's our speaker this afternoon. So let me say a word about Christine before passing the mic over to her. And I want to start by just reflecting back to when I graduated from this college back in 1990. The year that I graduated, Christine became a partner in the McCurcher Law Firm here in Saskatoon. And that's significant for this reason. So back then, at the time that I started pursuing my own path in private practice, I was wrestling with uh, a tension, I guess, that I can only describe as the tension between my desire to pursue excellence as, as a litigator and my desire to respect what I saw as humanity in, in my work as a lawyer. Among the big firm partners at the time, Christine stood out to me and has continued to over, over the 30 years that I've been a part of this profession in Saskatchewan. Let me just say a word about why. In addition to being a, a warm and compassionate person, a leader who encourages those around her, um, a mother, she's always been a model of success on even the narrowest and most traditional terms. Now a senior partner, a highly respected and successful litigator with a practice in some very interesting, discreet and specialized areas medical malpractice, personal injury, administrative law, including professional licensing, discipline, and labor law. She was appointed a Queen's, as, as Queen's Counsel in 1999. She's held a range of leadership positions in, in the country and in the province. Past president of the Saskatchewan branch of the CBA, past chair of the national health section of the CBA, on the management board for the Canadian Bar Insurance Association. Uh, she's the current chair in her firm's uh, health law practice group and uh, a member of the very prestigious American College of Trial Lawyers. Not surprisingly, Christine was recently selected by her peers to be on the best lawyers of Canada list uh, in the area of personal litigation 
um, or personal injury litigation. And she has consistently been listed in the Best Lawyers in Canada um, publication since 2006. So by all accounts, um, she's um, a leader and a wonderful person to be speaking to you about advocacy and what makes an excellent advocate. And it's just such a pleasure to have her here working with groups of law students over the course of today and other days um, around her chair. So join me in welcoming Christine. Thank you, Michaela, for that very kind introduction. I am greatly honoured to be here today as the Silas E. Halleck QC Chair in Advocacy. Cy was an adversary in a number of my cases, and I quickly understood why he was recognised as one of the leading trial lawyers in Saskatchewan and Canada. Nearing his retirement, he became of counsel at the McCurcher Law Firm and I had the benefit of consulting him on difficult issues, especially jury trials. Sai, like every excellent advocate, was not born with the skills of a trial lawyer. Advocacy involves a number of learned behaviors and skills as well as good instincts. The learning process continues throughout your career and involves a great deal of work and attention to detail. Each of you has the different talents and levels of confidence to make wonderful and good advocates. At the outset, I would like to place a rider on this presentation. Some of you will choose paths in public practice where funding issues affect the resources available to you. This will pose additional challenges to how you prepare your cases often with excessive caseloads. Your role in legal aid or other public law areas is critically important to the public interest and you will make a difference in many lives. In public law, you will learn how to best deal with the limited resources you have available to you. In private practice, some of the same pressures will affect our clients' ability to afford legal services. These limitations can affect the way we approach our representation in each case. I believe strongly in the value of providing a component of pro bono services in private practice. My comments today will still apply but with recognition that adjustments will have to be made to one's practice to meet the difficult circumstances. With this caveat, I hope my comments may resonate in some small way as you start your careers. When I started practice in 1980, my intention was bec to become a respected litigator in Saskatchewan. At that time, I thought it was all about one's courtroom presence, and I doubted my ability to succeed. For the generation of lawyers before me, including Mr. Halleck, the advocate was in the courtroom every week and often daily. A large part of the advocate's success and reputation did relate to the courtroom performance. This has changed significantly. I say this because until the mid and late 1980s, there were very few rules of disclosure for litigators. Once the relevant documents were disclosed in the statement as to documents, disclosure of one's case was concluded in the civil actions, except for pretrial questioning. There was no mandatory pretrial mediation, no settlement conference, no exchange of expert witness reports or pretrial settlement briefs of fact and law, and no exchange of witness lists. I got to see both systems in operation. The old approach amounted to what is commonly referred to as trial by ambush. This did not necessarily achieve justice between the parties, although some would certainly disagree with me on this point. This approach to advocacy did achieve greater access to the courtroom. As a result, the litigator's performance in court pre-1990s was particularly important. 
you saw a variety of approaches to courtroom advocacy and size generation, ranging from an aggressive intimidation of the witnesses to a slow and steady building block approach to the theory of the case. The surprise witness would blow the case out of the water, leaving the opponent with no avenue to respond on a spontaneous basis. Witnesses were frequently challenged with previous inconsistent statements. The hearsay rule was also more strictly applied. Surprise witnesses and unexpected expected testimony still occurs today. But the advocate's job has changed significantly with the mandated focus on efforts to early settlement and changes in the rules of court. During the 90s, strict disclosure rules were developed so that civil cases are now largely detailed in the pretrial pre disclosure stage. There's mandatory mediation, exchanges of, of witness lists, expert witness notices, and detailed pretrial briefs detailing the facts and the law. Failure to comply with the rules can adversely affect your case. The downside is that the laborious disclosure requirements add significant costs to the litigation if it proceeds to trial. This has affected the average client's ability to afford justice in the courtroom or before a tribunal. The lawyer's role in advocacy has also changed as a result of this evolution in the lit litigation process. In this presentation, I hope to raise your awareness of some key variables that will determine the type of advocates you will become. You have choices to make. As a newly minted lawyer, I was rattled when I first confronted lawyers who were rude untrustworthy or used aggressive and intimidating behavior to get their way, especially with inexperienced counsel. My mentors quickly informed me of these tacti tactics and who to watch out for. I also observed others manage this behavior. On one occasion, a notoriously devious lawyer accused me of not delivering the cash for conduct money when I served a subpoena for his witness to appear for questioning. I immediately phoned Don McKercher, a senior partner in the firm, and reported the incident. He, in turn, contacted the lawyer in, and informed him that if he did not produce his client for questioning, he would be reported to the Law Society. He did this in a very calm fashion. Mr. McKercher had no doubt that I had in fact delivered the cash and the witness showed up. This was a truly distressing experience, but one that taught me a lot of lessons. My colleagues had my back and my word was trusted. With time, you will quickly learn about the characteristics of your opponents. Preparing for inappropriate or unexpected behavior by an opponent or even your client in or outside the courtroom is part of your job as an advocate. When emotions rise, taking a break from the interaction to regroup is always a good option if available. A colleague is usually a phone call away and can also be of great assistance. But the real antidote to this or any inappropriate behavior is to remain calm and focused. An advocate who knows the factual and legal foundation of their case will not be distracted by bad behavior. Developing your poker face is part of your job. Be aware that choosing a path of aggressive and intimidating behavior to advocate is unlikely to build a reputation as a great advocate. It may be a preferred approach for certain clients but I personally have not observed this to be an effective way to achieve success in litigation. It goes without saying that clear communication is crucial to advocacy. There is oral and there is written advocacy. For your generation, written advocacy will be the bigger challenge and likely the larger part of your practice, especially in private practice. Every word you write to opposing counsel may show up at a hearing down the road. Your off-the-cuff 
emails or texts, as well as letters may end up attached to an affidavit. Until you have more experience in at practice and in the courtroom, you will not even recognize many of the evidentiary, procedural, and legal issues that may be compromised by the words used in your written communication. Worrying about my words is what kept me up at night in my early years and even now. Because of the imp importance of written advocacy, it is critical that communications with opposing counsel are not rushed. This is a difficult thing to do in the digital age, given the pressure of instant communication. In the legal profession, thinking about a problem has been and will continue to be critical to developing strategy to deal with that problem. In the era of snail mail, we had the luxury to think. Now you must proactively make the time to think. While there is an expectation of instantaneous response, this must be resisted in the appropriate circumstances. Identifying communications that require more thought and strategy in responding is part of your job as a good advocate. You are entitled to take the time you need in most circumstances. I have seen the Im immeasurable damage done to cases by knee-jerk responses. Especially in your early career, take the time to review not only your formal correspondence, but your emails and texts before pressing send. I also highly recommend that you strive to use good grammar and writing style in your communications. Trust your instincts if you have concerns. When the communication is addressing important issues, leave it for a period of time and revisit it later. Review the logic and implications of what you are saying. Carefully consider what your intentions are. And consult more senior colleagues to review and vet the communication with your concerns in mind. Also, access to similar files in the firm can provide examples of letters and submissions on topic that can be helpful in developing your communication style and skills. Having a mentor with excellent writing skills who is prepared to revise work occasionally is a bonus. If grammar and writing is not your strong suit, then I would highly recommend you access papers and books and courses to improve those skills. The best writer will have a distinct advantage. But these are skills that you can improve throughout your career. It does, however, take intention and effort on your part. I would like to touch briefly on the importance of pleadings. There is no shortage of bad pleadings in our profession, and yet it is the first documentation a judge will consider in assessing your application your case, and your advocacy skills. Drafting good pleadings requires knowledge of what a material fact is. That is the quintessential facts that must be proven to establish each cause of action alleged. The defense, in turn, must identify the essential facts to be proven in response. This sounds simple, but it is a common pitfall for lawyers at all levels of experience. Pleading evidence so early in the case creates a field of landmines. Pleadings of any fact constitutes an admission against interests that cannot be easily reversed or revised if you find you have made an error. Drafting pleadings is therefore central to good advocacy. I highly recommend that you focus on developing this boring skill early in your career. Aside from making erroneous or unnecessary admissions, pleadings set in stone the parameters of the case and the evidence you will be permitted to pursue through your demand for documents and questions you may ask at questioning and at trial. The first and most important step to good pleadings is to have a detailed understanding of the case and available evidence. This is essential to identifying the material facts. For example, the fact that the car went through the stop sign is obviously material. 
But much of the detail, the number of people in the car, the road surface, the weather, the position of the stop sign, foliage and vegetation in the ditch may not be material. Spend time thinking about how you will prove or defend the essential elements of the action before finalizing your pleadings. If a fact is not essential to the claim or defense, don't include it. Consider whether certain evidence is persuasive in asserting the claim or defense. Do not engage in storytelling. Accessing pleadings on court files involving respected counsel in similar cases can provide an excellent precedent to consider. You know that the court file is a public record and you can access any good litigants pleadings. You must also remember that each case is unique and has its own nuances. The cut, cut and paste function on your computer can end up doing a disservice if you are not carefully and thoughtfully reviewing every word in the document before court filing. Factual accuracy in pleading and written oral submissions is a hallmark of good advocacy. The court and your opponents will always assess whether your word can be trusted. Your word is critical to advancing your client's cases. If you make errors, correct them promptly with an apology and an explanation. Before drafting any pleadings or submissions that will land up in court or in the hands of opposing counsel, make sure you have done your due diligence in factual investigation of the claim or the defense. This process starts when the client's first con contact is made with your firm by requesting a narrative of the problem, preferably in writing, and production of, the, of all of the documents, you will generally need to tell the, the client specifically what documents you will require. You will have to guide the client in terms of the information you need because you are the one that knows what is required to establish the claim. The client doesn't. Your investigation also requires ongoing assessment of the client's credibility. Challenging the client's story and position is important to establishing factual accuracy. It also helps to shape the client's expectations of the process as they experience missteps and memory lapses. They begin to realize the technical requirements of good advocacy. This process takes time. You will find out critical information that could influence your investigation and the strategy of your written and oral advocacy. If the case involves allegations of, prof of professional negligence, you will need to retain an expert early on to review the facts and opine on the practice and standards of the profession. Expert evidence is an essential evidentiary element to establish professional negligence. I have seen many cases dismissed at trial for failing to produce expert testimony on central issues. I would suggest that your success as a lawyer depends more on your advocacy in preparing your case before the hearing than your advocacy during the hearing. In other words, a properly prepared case is a prerequisite to good advocacy and ensures factual accuracy in what you say and write. There is no doubt that a detailed investigation of, of the case at the outset can greatly enhance your ability to influence the direction that the case will take, as well as enhancing the likelihood of success. But is this approach sustainable for your clients? There is always a question of financial resources for most clients. You will develop your own barometer on how far you need to go to provide a good work product. I would argue that you will save your client money and stress by early and comprehensive assessment of the strength of the case. You might call this front-end loading. This in turn drives your strategy to settle early or to play hardball. Even when concerned about the escalation of legal fees and the client's ability to pay, the lawyer must balance the cost of the comprehensive investigation against a quality work product. 
If you end up having to throw away some of your time, the quality of your work product still will reap benefits. In the long run, your case and your advocacy will improve. This will lead to more and better files. A retainer to cover at least a reasonable amount of this front-end investigation should be requested early on unless you are prepared to take the risk of not being fully or even partially paid. It is also extremely important for your client to be willing to invest in the process, both in time and resources to the extent possible. For the impecunious client who can't afford to invest in what you consider to be a strong case, you may agree to carry the fees and the risk, but should always have a contingency agreement in place. Also, remember that costs are awarded against the losing litigant in most cases, which can be a significant liability for the client. The clients must go into the courtroom with their eyes open. The cost of the upfront due diligence is reduced by having the client prepare the written narrative of facts, the chronology of the events, the client can pursue the documents and provide written explanations with those documents where the inquiry does not have to be conducted by the lawyer. That choice should always be given to the client whenever possible to reduce the cost. I believe that if you approach your work on the basis that you will always put in more than you get out of each file, you will prosper financially and professionally. This is one of the basic premises long advocated by a number of renowned business coaches. I believe this also applies to good advocacy. Ideally, by the time you get into the courtroom, you should know most of the facts, most of the evidence, both good and bad. You should also have worked out the theory of your case. Do not leave this for the judge to sort out. That is like throwing an egg at a wall and waiting to see what sticks. Your witnesses should be prepared for trial and witness preparation is also a key to successful advocacy. It takes special skills in and of itself. Each witness needs to know the questions that will be asked in chief and you need to know the precise answers. This can take a significant amount of time, and for bad witnesses especially. Language skills and nerve problems are classic problems. Witnesses also need to know the questions that are likely to be asked in cross-examination and how to handle the responses. The old school litigants called this horse shedding the witness. I still hear this term occasionally today. In addition, you should have carefully contemplated and prepared for the objections and applications that may arise at trial. These issues often become obvious by the approach that opposing counsel takes in the pretrial stages. If you do not conduct a fulsome investigation of your case early on and leave the details to be worked out in the weeks leading up to the trial, you will likely not be well prepared for the courtroom phase of your role as an advocate. There is always more work than is anticipated in those last weeks. Last minute preparation is extremely stressful. It cannot entirely be avoided, but it can be significantly reduced with proper pretrial workup. If the case has not been properly prepared, it may be discovered that admissions were made in the pleadings that are regretted. Important issues of disclosure may not have been raised and it is now too late. Important questions may not have been covered in questioning and as a result, you don't know the answers to those questions. Important witnesses may not have been interviewed. All of these deficiencies become apparent as the case progresses, but may not be discovered until trial if the case has not been prepared early on. Now, if I were an NFL quarterback, how important would the pregame preparation be to my performance during the game? <coughs> I rest my case.
there is another facet to good advocacy that I would like to emphasize. Assuming the goal is to be a great advocate, there are a number of pitfalls that all lawyers face as they progress in the profession. How these issues are managed is important to the type of advocate that you will become. Will you view your legal practice as a business with maximization of profit as the primary goal and intention? Or will you view it as the provision of professional services with the primary focus on the quality of the work product and the manner of delivery? As a young lawyer throughout my career, I listened to this debate between lawyers. I cannot say that the corporate business model is wrong for a firm or that this model will necessarily compromise the work product. I can, however, say that individual lawyers who personally view the practice of law as a profession first, focusing first on professional obligations and quality of work product, will be very good advocates, whether you are a solicitor or a trial lawyer. Financial and business success will also follow good work product. Good advocates will not compromise the professional duty or the quality of work for monetary gain. They will rather forgo the time as the cost of maintaining their professional reputation and status. So to what extent should a lawyer accept a retainer from a client to advance a position that has little or no factual or legal basis and may even be contrary to public policy? Assume for the moment that this client is prepared to pay substantial sums of money for your services, but the client's sole intention is to damage a competitor's business or reputation. To accept such a retainer may not be a breach of any law, but could, in my view, detract from your credibility professionally. Such ret retainers would likely involve making submissions that lack credible foundation. This type of conduct will reflect on, the cr on your credibility as a lawyer and a trusted advocate. Our credibility makes a big difference to our success in dealing with other lawyers and the judiciary throughout the course of our careers. Mr. Cohen, past legal counsel to US President Trump, is an extreme example of a lawyer who became the client's hired gum. His legal practice was geared to profit as opposed to professional duty and quality of work. There are many shades of gray before you reach the stage of Mr. Cohen. Where will you draw that line? Another feature of great advocacy, often forgotten, is balance and emotional well-being. It is widely accepted that stress-related illness, uh, illnesses are becoming epidemic in this digital age. It relates in part to our inability to turn off and just be in the moment. This raises a number of important practice issues for new lawyers. Are you inclined to become a workaholic lawyer? As lawyers starting out in practice, you will likely be expected to work very hard and at times very long hours. You are likely already doing that having got to this stage of your career. In the early years of practice, the learning curve is steep and the quality of work product generally takes longer to achieve than you could expect. In the beginning at least, nearly every single thing that is given to you as a young lawyer will be a mystery and requires you to start from scratch to figure out what the heck you're supposed to do. I would say this is a characteristic of practice for the first three to five years. One must be aware of and guard against workaholic behaviors that extend throughout one's career. The workaholic lawyer typically is confined to the four walls of the office 24-7 throughout the professional career. They often find it most efficient to do all the work alone due to the time it would take to instruct and mentor other lawyers. This is a classic excuse. Undeniably, the clients of 
of the workaholic can be well served. Also, they become uh, they can become much more demanding because their lawyer is usually available 24/7. It is a com it is common for such lawyers to be lone wolves, rarely working in teams with appropriate delegation of mentorship. They cannot leave their practice to go on holidays because they have nobody that they trust to look after their files. If they do go on holidays, they take their work with them. I think all lawyers are a little bit guilty of that, but it can become very extreme. Such lawyers have no life outside of the firm. Their families will have very little contact with them. The problem with this scenario is that the stress of this life builds each and every year. Many of these very capable lawyers succumb to stress and may be required to leave the practice due to health issues. There is also a higher risk of premature death, alcoholism, drug addiction, as well as broken marriages. This is not to say that lawyers in general are not at risk of these health and social issues. I fell into the habit of having the reward of a glass of wine at the end of each day. The reward grew as the stress grew. What we do not realize is that the wine can become self-medication that in itself leads to anxiety and more stress. It becomes a vicious circle. When I decided to limit the wine to weekends with friends, I was amazed to discover that I went through several weeks of feeling anxious when I did not get my glass of wine at the end of the busy day. More importantly, I had more energy and felt better. Be careful about self-medication. A truly great firm does not encourage workaholic behaviors. A truly great firm desires lawyers who are healthy, balanced, yet hardworking contributors who are part of the professional team that supports one another. I agree that it is a double-edged sword in that firms will be the ones that set the billing targets and press lawyers to perform. There will always be a bis business component to the practice of law, at least in private practice. Each of us must learn to set our own healthy limits. You will likely be faced with many challenges in balancing your career. This is critical to achieving happiness and fulfillment in your personal life, as well as professional success. Great advocates also tend to be very good mentors and contributors to the firm's professional image, as well as contributing to the community at large. This can be a very, very tall order and must be approached very carefully by lawyers, young and old. First and foremost, guard your personal time focusing on your health and family commitments. This, however, must be balanced first also with your professional obligations to your clients. At times, you will be required to work excessive hours, but this should become the, should become the exception, not the rule. I became a partner in January 1990, and my third child was born in October 1991. Having children was a personal choice I made. I found that I became more efficient out of necessity when I had children. I put in the work when I had to. I tried to leave it behind at the office at the end of the day. I did not like split shifts. I was fortunate to have a stable marital relationship with a very supportive spouse who encouraged my professional pursuits. He had his own business and was able to adjust for me. I always took vacation with my family at Christmas, family week, and during the summer. Every situation is different, but I guarantee that you will have no regrets for the time you take from your professional life to be with your family. Also, it does not have to detract from your work. If I have any regrets at this time, it would be that I should have taken, controlled my hours of work more than I did, especially after I became a partner. In the preliminary years of practice, I recommend you focus heavily on your work product and developing good work habits in your file management. 
I do highly recommend you participate in local bar functions and be active in the Canadian Bar Association. This professional involvement is important to the development of your career. Good relations with your colleagues outside of the firm facilitates your dealings with other lawyers and your overall advocacy. As time goes on, you may accept invitations to sit on boards or sit, assist with community projects, pro bono or otherwise. You may already be doing this. I know many of you are avid contributors. Such involvements are not required though, and they can be very stressful if you are unable to fulfill your work and family obligations. But they can be important to your professional life, so it is part of your job to set priorities. I have a few concluding remarks. Oral advo advocacy, especially in the courtroom or before tribunals, will be stressful for most of you. The rush of adrenaline is what keeps us engaged. We often hear from experienced performers who worry about their next success when performing before live audiences. I assure you that there are way more variables in the courtroom than in TCU place. Litigators are often compared to performers, but unlike professional performers, the lawyer will have a big impact on the interests of the client who is paying for the performance. We have no professional lighting or sound staging, and we have no control over the audience, the judge, or jury. Moreover, we have to contend with opposing counsel who also shares the stage and can be expected to boo our performance. You will not be able to pre-stage the songs, comedic show, or script the plays. The range of possible witnesses may or may not testify, and if they do, it may not be according to the expected script. A single change in facts can sink your case. Such facts will unexpectedly come out of the mouths of witnesses. This is always devastating, but it happens, and the show must nevertheless go on. Lawyers tend to be control freaks, but you cannot control everything that happens in the courtroom. At the end of the day, the only control you have is a well-prepared and thought-out case. That preparation will address the variables as best as you can. The goal is to neutralize the surprise as best you can. You also have some control over the way you organize your practice and balance your life. Your health and happiness will enhance your advocacy skills. If one has a well-prepared case thing and things do not go well, you should have no regrets and no self-doubts. Your performance will have been as best it could be in the circumstances. Your client will respect the work you did in most cases and the outcome. The court will respect your advocacy. Marie Heinine, uh, Gian Gomeshi's legal counsel said, we have the best legal system in the world. In, in responding to the criticisms that she had betrayed her gender, she said that was not her job. Her job was to provide her client with an opportunity to be heard and a fair trial before an impartial judge. She said she could not guarantee the result and justice does not guarantee the result you want. As lawyers, you are going to leave a lasting impact on many people. Your words and your actions matter. I have found it very helpful to frame clients' cases not on the basis of whether we win or lose, but rather on the basis of whether we obtain a fair trial. And that is, should always be the focus. 
and whether we can, with a fair trial, achieve justice between the parties, but that does not guarantee the result. What drives me as an advocate is a strong instinct of what I believe is in the circumstances of my case a just result. In this way, I do my best and I feel comfortable at the end with the decision that is made. I wish you well in your professional pursuits and I look forward to working with the many MOOC teams that may reach out over the next few weeks. Thank you very much. The media poses, poses a lot of challenges to every lawyer, and if it is a high media case, you have to be prepared. So any approach during the course of trial, we tend to reserve uh, our comments uh, for open court, and uh, we tend not to, to offer opinions about the case, or at least that, that is my approach. At the end of the case, um, and I can think of one particular case in particular, um, the Bert uh, case w involving uh, a, pr a plaintiff who had a tubal ligation, a young woman, and she ended up with all of her limbs removed and brain damage because of a, a raging infection she acquired. It was an incredibly tragic case, and in cases like that, um, all you can do is, is thank the judge and the jury for having the courage to arrive at the decision that they did in such a difficult case. And, um, and that kind of comment depersonalizes it. Uh, but I, I tend to keep the comments depersonalized and focused on justice and supporting our, our judicial system, um, even if I don't like the results. There's always a lot of criticism to go around. And, and, the, and the, usually, the, my experience, the press is never there very much. They're only there for the sensational witnesses, so they don't, they don't have a balanced view of the evidence that, that is presented at trial. Not sure I answered your question, but other questions. Oh. I don't say no tension between the courts of advocacy and the judiciary, but some lawyers who come to trial and have the courage to say no tension are very I do, and I'm going to go back to the same case, the Barrett versus Graham case that I just referred to. In that case, it, it was tragic for the plaintiff, and it was also tragic for the physician who conducted the tubal ligation because the plaintiffs did exactly what 
a, and and lawyers to extent to to an extent, but primarily the plaintiffs uh, presented a, a horrific picture of of this obstetrician um, as as a butcher that and the newspaper used the word butcher. And it was interesting because when the case finished, uh, I didn't represent Dr. Graham in, in, in this part of his journey, but he hired a defamation lawyer in British Columbia who took the case uh, through trial. And I, I'm not sure if it's still, if it's under appeal, but he was successful in um, his defamation case against the Star Phoenix. So, you know, the reporting by a newspaper is, is open to challenge. And your lawyers who speak about their case outside of the courtroom are open to professional discipline for making comments that are not factually based. So I think it's very dangerous to do that.